Welcome to the Victor Emanuel Nature Tours webinar. I'm Ben Reynolds, producer and host of the Vent webinar series. Thank you for joining us today. We are delighted to offer this educational presentation, and we hope you enjoyed today's topic on Namibia, Botswana, Zambia, birds and wildlife across three Southern African countries. I would like to welcome and introduce you all to Jeff Lockwood, who is joining us live from South Africa. Hello, Jeff. Hi there, Ben, and hi, everybody. Jeff Lockwood's interest and involvement with birds dates back to his early years at school and forms part of a wider interest in the biodiversity of the Southern African subregion. After leaving school, he began a career as a bird artist, illustrator, and author. In 1981, he published Garden Birds of Southern Africa, and later also contributed half the illustrations to the fifth and sixth edition of Robert's Birds of Southern Africa. Jeff is currently based at the Delta Environmental Center in Johannesburg, where he acts as a part-time manager and education officer, working to instill an environmental ethos in teachers and school groups that visit the center. For the past 30 years, he has been involved with local birding organizations and has served on the Council of the Southern African Ornithological Society, now BirdLife South Africa, for most of that time. He travels widely in the region, presenting lectures, talks, and courses on bird identification, ecology, and behavior, and is also involved in the training of local bird guides as part of the BLSA initiative to give communities a vested interest in the conservation of their local birds. With 870 species listed within Southern Africa, Jeff is among the region's top birders. He has led tours to many destinations in Southern and Central Africa, as well as Kenya and Israel. Welcome, Jeff. Thanks for being here today. Now we will turn to your presentation. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and greetings from a rather cool Johannesburg, South Africa. Today I'm going to be sharing with you experiences on one of my favorite tours that I lead for VENT and that is the, the one that takes us to Namibia, Botswana and Zambia and uh, in the process we're able to look at birds and wildlife across three very different Southern African countries. I've called the talk Just Add Water because one of the features of this trip is the way in which we uh, encounter and observe on a, on a detailed basis the importance and the impact of water, either its scarcity or its abundance on the, both the diversity and also the numbers of birds and other wildlife that occur. And this scene from the Okakuyu waterhole in Etosha uh, just emphasizes the reliance on water and the need for water driving all life in this part of the world. I've included the event map of the trip just so people can orientate themselves and get a sense of what goes on. On the pre-trip people f normally fly into Johannesburg and then fly through the next day to Valfus Bay where we picked up by our local agent and we actually go exploring the salt works and also the dune fields and the Quisep Delta uh, just south of Valfus Bay itself and um, the environment here is strongly influenced by the icy ocean the Atlantic that you can see in picture um, is swept by a very cold current which comes up from the southern oceans and sweeps up the western side of southern Africa and brings with it an immense upwelling of nutrient-rich uh, detritus from the, the ocean floor. And it's this nutrient-rich water which drives an incredibly rich fishery and then obviously the birds like cormorants which actually depend on the fishery uh, for their sustenance. So uh, the other impact of that cold current is that moisture coming in off the sea is generally low. Um, the, the air coming in off the ocean is generally low in moisture 
and there is very little precipitation or rainfall in the area that we are to, that we will be exploring okay so we then head up um, we'll be looking at a range of birds uh, the salt works in particular to support large numbers of shorebirds both residents and migrants including the odd American vagrants which pitch up on occasion and this is one of the more gorgeous members of the shorebird group the little chestnut banded plovers and a substantial part of the world population of this this delightful little bird gather on the Namibian coast to actually breed so we should see numbers of these birds and also see youngsters amongst them at the time of our visit other birds that occur along the coast are birds like the little Damara tern a tiny little tern one of the world's smallest and this is a another one of the species which actually has its breeding ground concentration on the Namibian coastline so probably more than 80% of the world population actually breeds in the area we'll be visiting uh, they should just be arriving at the time of our tour and then we also in the saltworks as already mentioned have large numbers in excess of a hundred thousand birds of both greater and lesser flamingos we've got lesser flamingos depicted here and inland away from the coast we have uh, in the Quisip Delta a chance of seeing the delightful little dune lark top right and then on the stonier areas inland particularly from the uh, Swakopmund salt works we actually have got this rather drab looking lark called Gray's lark and this is an interesting bird that actually often will call and display at night now during the summer months um, ground temperatures can be extreme to put it mildly and so this bird has actually adopted a, a nocturnal display and calling behavior which actually protects it against the harsh heat during the day away from the coast again uh, the geology in the Namib and the Skeleton Coast National Park are, are very raw and unfinished and to me it almost looks like the earth is still taking shape and 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 rock is being extruded onto the surface almost as as you watch so it has a very stark beauty to it the, the plants where you do find plants tend to show various adaptations to the the very dry conditions uh, fleshy succulent stems and obviously like this dollar bush on the left of picture very fleshy leaves where the moisture can be stored along the coast as well uh, we have vast fields of lichens a number of different species are involved and they grow not just on the rocks and stones but also on the sand itself and what's really interesting about these is the way in which during dry periods the lichens almost shrivel up and, and curl in on themselves to conserve moisture and then when a sea fog comes in off the the cold water offshore they open up and absorb as much of the moisture as much of the condensation as they possibly can and then roll up again once things start warming up and drying out so really interesting and and attractive variety of of lichen and another really amazing plant is the one in picture here this is a, a thing called the Velvichia Velvichia miriobalis and it is a bizarre plant it is fascinating for all sorts of reasons in this incredibly harsh environment it actually can live for potentially as long as 2000 years in that time it only produces two large strap like very leathery leaves and uh, 
were it not for the effects of the fierce winds which actually blow through the area and also possibly a bit of the grazing pressure from antelope like oryx and springbok those leaves would just keep growing and possibly end up close to 100 feet in length the stem is woody the plants are conifers they, they actually produce cones and the plants are dioecious so the male and female are different plants and they produce different cones and the pollination is carried out by some of the most noxious looking brightly colored bugs that you'll see anywhere they just literally scream do not even think about trying to eat me so the virtue when we if we head in that direction uh, and we find some of these plants growing close to the tourist roads you'll probably notice a ring of stones set around each one of the plants and the reason for these stones is to actually try and discourage people from coming closer to the the plant because in doing so the sheer foot pressure of all the human visitors coming to look at these incredible plants will compact the soil and prevent the plant from actually being able to absorb the, the fog condensate uh, out of the sand so just by going to look at them you potentially could actually risk their survival although I mentioned a few antelope species this part of the world is very much reptile country it's still fairly cool at the time of our visit in in mid to late August and because of that um, we normally only start seeing the reptiles moving around once it warms up slightly this is one of the more unusual ones this is a male namaqua chameleon that that row of really sort of substantial looking spines along the back of the animal are its primary identification feature but there are various members of the the gecko family that also occur in these harsh environments once we've done with our exploration of the coast we'll meet up with the rest of the group that are joining the main tour and we will then head up to a a rain blessed at least by contrast to the coast a rain blessed area called the Waterberg and the Waterberg actually is more mountainous as one would expect from the name and also generally a lot more vegetated uh, still very interesting plants including things like that very stark white sterculia or, or ch star chestnut tree um, depending on the rainy season there could be plenty of grass which typically at the time we're there is already dry and golden um, but in dry areas it may just be very barren uh, most of the trees are devoid of leaf and the ground may be completely lacking in grass cover but whatever the situation the birds tend to be around and we tend to have really good birding in this in this area one of the most spectacular birds is a near endemic called the Montero's hornbill a medium-sized bird with this beautiful massive red bull gray head and neck and then these white spangles on the wing covers in flight this bird shows extensive white in the flight feathers both on the wings and tail and is a very very striking and obvious and easily identifiable bird as a result other specials of the area and these again include a number of either Namibian endemics or at least regional endemics which are pretty well confined to southern Africa include the top left a male short-toed rock thrush and then again top right some violet wood hoopoos and those of you who've never had the joy of watching wood hoopoos they are amazing amazing creatures they are gregarious they typically breed as an extended family with the young of a previous brood hanging on to help raise their, their younger siblings and uh, periodically the flock will get together 
on the same perch very often or on adjacent perches and they start bowing and rocking and and almost rolling right around the perch and giving off a call which uh, in the Zulu culture is described as the laughter of old women so uh, the South African version of Violet Wood Hoopoo is known sh as Schlegge Bafaz, which is the laughter of old women and it's very very apt it sounds very much like a, uh, a bunch of geriatrics giggling about some some joke or other <laughs> The other two birds are, are typical of the rock outcrops and the mountainous habitat in these areas and they include the Hartlob spurfowl, a male bird in picture bottom right, and the Damara rock runner, uh, a bird with a beautiful warbled song. Um, by our kind of local warbler standards, a real stunner, a, a you know, very strikingly marked bird and quite a large bird. Also in the area are uh, the chances of several different babbler species. In fact, with a bit of luck, we'll hope to show you all five of the region's babbler species on this tour. But this is the bear cheat babbler. And this is a bird very often found in Mapani woodland, a type of um, semi-deciduous broadleaf tree, which covers much of the area that we travel through, particularly in the middle part of Itosha. Now, in these harsh environments, babblers actually have developed a lot of interesting social adaptations and a related species to this one that occurs in dry thornfelt habitat actually has been recorded trying to kidnap young fledglings from an adjacent flock to boost its own numbers. So this family will try and recruit through kidnapping additional members of the flock to help protect and defend their territories during the winter months when food is particularly scarce. So bear cheek babblers and the southern pied babblers, the species I've been referring to, are just two of the babbler species we'll be looking for. In Itosha, um, I think it's it's famous for many things, but uh, quality of game viewing generally. But one of the things for me that always um, strikes is the, the the fact we enter the reserve on the western side and we progress steadily across the 900 or so miles, uh, sorry, 90 miles uh, that form the extent east-west extent of the pan and this pan is a shallow depression which has been scoured out by wind and during the, the wet season during the summer months it can fill up with water and become a sea inland sea which is typically no, no deeper than about four feet at its deepest but it teems with life all sorts of fish are carried down by tributaries into the pan they breed all uh, hosts of fish-eating birds and the flamingos, many of the ones we would have seen down on the coast, could have actually bred in the pans at Itosha before moving down to the coast. But again, the thing that strikes is this incredible contrast. You've got this low, open, vast, flat scrubland with nothing higher than almost calf height and striding across looking completely out of context and out of place is this group of giraffe and these kind of these kind of scenes are so typical for me of, of Itosha the dust 
that that one animal is kicking up with every step and this just sheer um, sheer stark contrast of, of, of habitat and these immensely tall animals. The birding is brilliant. A uh, large variety of, of again desert adapted birds as one would expect. Uh, birds such as your sand grass are not uncommon and top left we have a stunning male Namaqua sand grass, a regional endemic. Uh, raptors are also well represented and one of the most attractive of all our raptor species for me is the, the beautiful little red-necked falcon. And then coming down to bottom right we have one of the songsters of this dry, often thorn dominated environment is the Kalahari scrub robin, another regional endemic. And then our last bird bottom left is the scaly weaver or scaly feathered finch and this little bird is amazing because it's actually in, in captivity being shown to be able to survive for up to three months without access to any surface water feeding only on dry grass seeds and, and other plant seeds plus maybe the odd insect this bird is able to actually manage its water and recycle tissue water in a way that has allowed it to survive. Splashes of color are provided by birds like the lilac breasted roller and possibly the uh, some of the other roller species but the swallowtail bee eater is fairly widespread across these arid zones and just brings this absolute beautiful combination of turquoise blue and apple green with that yellow throat setting the whole thing off. So really pretty bird and one we would potentially see on a number of our stops th through the tour. Other interesting birds, um, probably one of the most striking and vivid is the bird top left which is a crimson breasted gonalek and the crimson-breasted gonalek, that chest color reminds one of a vermilion flycatcher. It's that vivid, that intense, and that combined with the black upper parts and the white wing bar just sets this bird off in this really stark thorn, um, thorn felt environment which it is in which it's typically found. Another sand grass, this is a virtual sand grass, a regional endemic, as was the gonalek. And these birds come down to drink, as is usually the case with sand grass, at very specific times during the day. This bird drinks roughly from about 8.30 to 9.30 in the mornings. And males with chicks out in the desert away from the water. The water is always a dangerous place because of the concentration of both mammalian and and bird predators which wait for birds to come in and drink. Uh, so the sand grass come in, they take a few quick sips and if they have chicks waiting for them out in the desert, the males then settle in the water and rock backwards and forwards or do little push-ups and in the process they soak the belly feathering uh, with several grams of water which they then fly out back to the chicks, stand over the chicks and as the chicks pull on the tips of these feathers the water is released from between the barbules and, is, and trickles down into the chick's throat. So a really fascinating way of carrying water. Bottom right is a bird called a double banded corsa, one of potentially three corsa species that we could see while in Etosha. And then this stunning bird bottom left is a white quilled or, or white winged bustard and uh, locally known as a northern black bustard or northern black Koran. It's not all about birds in Etosha, the game is diverse, it's spectacular and it also has a very strong affinity with water. So much of our viewing takes place either at the 
water holes located right next to the camp and these are often floodlit or typically floodlit at night so you can sit there and watch all sorts of things coming down to drink but also as we drive through the reserve we will stop at a number of natural springs or other water points and actually wait for game to come in and drink so starting at the top left that striking animal with the massively long straight horns is an oryx or chimpsbok locally and then the top right is a animal known as a honey badger or rattle and these animals are notorious for their aggression and they uh, they literally will not back down for lions although they're the size of a small to medium sized dog they are incredibly fierce and they, they literally won't back down for anything. This one is very industriously digging for small rodents um, on one of our drives. Then below right is the a small group of springbok, uh, Antidorcus marsupialis, and these are not marsupials, but they do have a semi-pouch located on the haunch on the back just up from the tail to roughly the top uh, of the back leg there is a f double fold of skin which when these b animals are actually excited and are displaying they bounce around on stiff legs with their backs arched and that fold opens up and this crescent of long white hair that is just visible particularly on the animal on the left stands upright forming this incredibly strong visual crescent mark which you can see across the felt for literally miles and so if the animals are excited about a predator that draws everyone's attention to the fact there could be something going on just as the animals have to come down to water on a regular basis to drink the predators actually also are typically found more often than not hanging around the water holes because this is the easiest place to catch your lunch and here are two lion cubs in no state at this age to actually do their own hunting but still intensely interested on what was um, hanging around in the distance waiting to come down when it was safe to drink On the west of Itosha, we've got a good chance of actually getting to grips with this incredible um, combination of a fascinating bird and an amazing nest. This is the social or sociable weaver and behind it you see just a tiny part of a massive apartment block like nest which these birds build. Uh, the biggest colonies can sometimes have more than 250 individual nest chambers each occupied by a, a pair of birds and these guys build these nests out of grass as you can see they are restricted in terms of the the rainfall levels to areas with a rainfall of between 3 and 23 inches per annum on average and what happens is below 3 inches generally speaking you don't get grass the grass cover does not have a chance to develop and so there's nothing for these birds to build and very often there are no big trees in which to build either and then at above 23 inches of rain per annum something completely different happens the water sort of seeps into the nest structure doesn't dry out and the whole nest turns into an aerial compost heap and decomposes falls out of the tree so down here during w the wet seasons when we actually may have maybe seven to ten above average rainfall years in a row um, the whole population of social weavers actually contracts west, further westwards and basically you know sort of keeps in the dry zone and then during our drought periods where again we may have seven to ten uh, below average rainfall years small colonies start appearing further and further across to the east 
and as soon as we get normal rain again those colonies basically just disintegrate and the birds go back to their heartland other birds uh, raptors are well represented as I've said and this is one of our smallest the pygmy falcon top left a female feeding on a on a locust and then a delightful little bird called a, a rufous-eared warbler a prinier like warbler uh, which is found in dry scrubby country on the western side of Etosha and then from a mammal perspective here you see both the smallest bottom left the Kirks or Damara Dictic, a tiny little antelope with a, a rather strange almost proboscis like nose that whiff, it whiffles from side to side and it's tiny it's it's pretty much the size of a hare um, and then the biggest of all African antelopes the the eland and also in that picture there are a couple of also fairly large antelope behind which are greater kudu with their beautiful spiral horns. Itasha is noted for its its rhinoceros population originally uh, just black rhinoceros but uh, a number of white rhinoceros were introduced from South Africa and seem to be doing quite well um, often our sightings are at the camp water holes which are floodlit during the night and these animals come to drink just as it gets dark and black rhino are supposed to be very antisocial solitary beasts with very limited social interactions with others of their kind so it's amazing to watch small groups maybe a mother and her calf come down and meet up with another female and her calf and they little you know they will touch noses for 20 minutes and just catch up on the gossip and then move off uh, often particularly at Okakuyu you can actually have the cows come in drink water with their calves then they go off to the side and she will lie down if the calf is quite big and she will allow the calf to suckle and the rather strange squealing and squeaky noises that these animals make are totally um, wrong for the sort of robust and and sturdy impression that the the animals give you when they're moving around And as you move further east, the rain, even just across that 90 mile span uh, from one end of the pan to the other, you can see already the impact of change of soils, change of rainfall. And here at Namatoni, which is the camp on the eastern side of our, our traverse, you already see some really dense, tall woodland and this massive elephant bull that you see drinking here is a fine example of the the really big elephants that typify the population in Etosha from Etosha we actually will take our small plane or planes and then fly to a dirt strip in the Namibian extension easterly extension called the Caprivi strip and from there we'll be picked up on on game drive vehicles and taken through the Mehango game reserve uh, which is where the Okavango River comes out of Angola and cuts through the Caprivi strip and down into Botswana to form the famous Okavango Delta uh, we'll be dropped off at the Botswana border and picked up by vehicles from the lodge where we'll be staying Namaseri and Namaseri is set on the panhandle part of the Okavango Delta system so it's 
starting to broaden out there st the start of floodplains between the various channels but it hasn't formed the delta fan which occurs further down into the delta proper um, Botswana is an amazing country and on the flight in um, and the drive-in you'll notice how incredibly dry it is and then suddenly you get to the edge of the water and you get this beautiful emerald green fringe of flooded grasslands you see tall trees you see palms and um, the impact of water is instantly apparent and even more so when you get into camp and you wake up on your first morning and you just hear this absolute cacophony of different bird calls you are in birding paradise here Botswana is a very dry country most of the country is is overlaid by what is known as the Kalahari semi-desert and so nowhere is the impact of water more visible than when you actually cross from the dry backwards into this gem this absolute paradise green paradise alive with birds and other wildlife Botswana is one of the few in fact the only country that actually has the same name for rain as they use for the currency so the currency in Botswana is the Pula and Pula is the name for rain and Pula just to emphasize the importance of water to a very uh, arid country for the most part is also one of the toasts when you're actually having your sundowner you raise your glass and you say Pula hoping for rain the activities at Amasiri are as you see here we go out for the most part in boats we do sometimes drive along the floodplain to look for certain spe uh, specific um, species and we also got um, you know on these long long trips we've got uh, drinks on board we it's a, an open boat there's no canopy so you need to be sure you bring your sunscreen along but it's a wonderful way to see the world you just travel along you see big crocodiles slipping back into the water occasionally we see hippo and virtually all of the herons and storks and uh, even the odd wattled cranes flying over and scenes like this the African blue water lilies the back lagoons with just a sea of these open flowers of breathtaking little gems of malachite kingfishers buzz across the water surface low over high-pitched little calls bee eaters fly overhead the trees around camp are visited by a whole range of different fruit-eating birds which come in to feed on the ripening berries of the jackal berry trees and one of the sheer joys of being at Namaseri is this idea that you can take to the Makoros these are these dugout canoes that were the traditional mode of transport in the Delta the water bushmen that actually live in the Delta use these to move from point to point and also go fishing off them and it's the most incredibly peaceful and joyous way to travel you get through you just hear the sort of uh, grind of the sand as the pole is dug into the sandy bottom of the channel um, the little rustle of, of the bow wave at the bow and then the brush of the reeds and the grasses as you move through and then your polar will stop and point out maybe a beautiful little reed frog clinging to a reed stem right next to you that you had not even seen so it's a wonderful experience for me one of the best things about going to Maseri is the fact that we have the chance to show you and let you experience the joys of Makoro travel birds are brilliant color generally more colorful than uh, many of the species we saw in Etosha and on the coast in Namibia uh, but here we have a bird called a black collared barbet top left an African green pigeon top right Myers parrot and then one of the smaller and more interesting and more unusually colored uh, herons 
a rufous-bellied heron. So uh, bird diversity very much a jump up from the drier areas that we visited in Namibia. And then just a scene from one of the boat trips, the papyrus reeds uh, are the origin of the original paper made by the ancient Egyptians and home to a couple of endemics and special birds that we look for and try and call out into full view which is not always easy because papyrus is incredibly dense and surprisingly featureless when you're trying to point out uh, to the group warrior to look. At this time that we visit, uh, the flood from the Angolan highlands, which actually drives the Okavango system, is generally subsiding. And as the riverbanks are now becoming more and more exposed, the first scouting parties of southern carmine bee eaters arrive and they start looking for areas where they can potentially start excavating their nest tunnels. And this has got to be in, you know, this bird is in absolute full fresh breeding plumage when we see them. And it is like a neon light going off um, in the trees. It's an incredibly beautiful and incredibly unusually colored bird, which generally has everybody gasping and reaching for their cameras. We do offer a night boat trip. And typically, apart from the chance of seeing crocodiles by night uh, with spotlights, we are looking for two big birds in particular. The bird in picture, the absolutely beautiful little white-backed night heron. And then also one of the real target species of, of the whole tour, the pearls fishing owl. And both birds are possible on these night boat trips. Amaseri lies fairly close or is situated fairly close to a very interesting World Heritage Site area called Tsudilo Hills. Tsudilo Hills a few thousand years ago stood overlooking a large inland lake and that has progressively dried up altogether but at the at the height of the the lake period there were quite a large population of sand people living in the area uh, relying on a combination of hunting gathering and fishing uh, for their, their food needs and the Tsudilo hills are covered with panels of exquisite rock art such as you see here uh, just in this picture there are rhino their giraffe their eland and various other animals and it's a fascinating place there's even uh, a, a panel with what looks like a penguin this is probably about 800 miles from the coast and also something which looks rather like a whale so obviously uh, either the artists were traveling those kind of distances across to the Atlantic coastline or they had been told about these strange things by people who had made the trip. So this is one of the optional uh, excursions from Amaseri. And then just the typical end to a day you out on the river and you, you slowly heading back. The sky is full of, of various herons and other water birds moving to and from um, their roost sites and feeding grounds. And it is just such a calm and and cool and and beautiful contrast to the dry and slightly dusty experiences of, of Itosha. So fantastic, fantastic end to the day. So from Maseri, we actually uh, board our aircraft, uh, usually smaller aircraft because the Namaseri airstrip is quite small and short so we cannot um, all fly together in one of the bigger charter aircraft that that the groups use and we fly down the panhandle section of the Okavango heading now towards the Delta Fan and our stop is a camp one of the very first camps established in the Maremi Game Reserve in the, in the heart of the Okavango and the camp's name 
Akanaka, it's the, um, the San or one of those uh, tribal groupings that use clicks in their language. So X is a palette click. So Akanaka. Um, and this is the best part of the day. This is as the sun goes down, uh, our local guide has actually chosen a site where it's safe to get down off the vehicle and stand around and maybe go behind an ant, uh, a termite mound if you need a bit of a comfort break and then have that absolute essential tradition of the trip, the sundowner. And that's what's happening here. And also in this picture, this is now a different group and a different sundowner spot. But in the background over the head of the second person from the left, you can actually see an elephant placidly grazing. And uh, this is one of the real joys of this part of the tour. This business of being in Africa, um, enjoying it basically almost on your own for the most part. Back at camp at night, uh, as you go back to camp from, uh, from your game drive vehicle before dinner, uh, keep your eyes open because there are a group of lesser bush babies or what we call nachapis or night apes um, that actually feed and sometimes even play around the tents where you'll be sleeping. Uh, we also sometimes have a hippo which comes out and actually sleeps on the ground just outside your tent, in which case you will know all about how well and how loudly Hippo can snore uh, by the end of your stay at Akanaka. Just a, a classic view from an uh, area called Paradise Pools, one of the places we visit um, on our game drives. And in the foreground you have a, a, a special and quite localized heron species called the Slaty Egret and then a row of rather attractive swamp-loving antelope called red lechware who have rather long splayed hooves which allow them to actually run through the mud effectively and behind that again a very relaxed and and chilled elephant just enjoying the lush grass close to the water the larger birds, uh, some of the more spectacular ones that we pick up in this area, include things like the African fish eagle. In fact, from Amaseri all the way through to Livingston and uh, the Zambezi River, you will be hearing the calls of this bird. And then the saddlebill stalk, named for that yellow saddle-like um, wattle above the, the base of the bill and then wattled crane and then pinkback pelican and the pinkback pelicans if we've had a good wet season and there have been a number of cut-off pools that have actually been left behind uh, as the, the initial flood out of Angola starts drying back these are where these pelicans actually find feeding just an absolute dawdle they just literally swim slowly around scooping up fish after fish and uh, they're often in full breeding plumage as you can see in these birds here so really really attractive and interesting to pick them up starlings are abundant and we could see as many as five different species of starlings including this one the greater blue-eared starling which is one of the more striking ones And I had to put this picture in because for me this sums up the magic of Akanaka more than any other. There are two species that I would specifically want to show everyone who tours with me. Bird on the left, the Pell's fishing owl, is still one of my all-time favorite species. And then anywhere in Africa where you have a chance, a leopard sighting is the ultimate it's just the most incredible animal and these two pictures were taken from the same place of the two animals so on the one side of the vehicle looking up into the tree you could see a pearls fishing owl and on the other side 
draped lazily over a branch was a gorgeous young female leopard. And that, to me, more than anything else, sums up the magic and the, the anticipation uh, that goes with actually traveling around Akanake. You are never, you know, able to predict what you're going to see. Um, so everything is out there. Everything is possible. And luck does happen. And this would be just as special. The African wild dog, or sometimes called the painted wolf, is a uh, carnivore that hunts as a pack. They are very good at actually immediately assessing the fitness of, of maybe a group of antelope and picking out a weakling, some someone that may be ill or injured. And uh, they will focus on that animal and run it down. And when they finally catch up with it, they literally all leap up and just grab chunks out of it. And from the first bite to literally the animal having disappeared and just a couple of bones left behind, can take maybe eight or ten minutes at most. So they're incredibly efficient. They bolt down their, their, their meal. And if they have got pups and they could be starting to den at the time we are at Akanaka, um, the b adults, everyone in the pack, will go back to the den with this, these chunks of meat in the stomach. And if pups beg from them, they automatically regurgitate, whether they were actually the parents of the pups or not. So they're interesting animals, fascinating animals, and it's not every year we see them, but when we do see them like this, it's really a special, special event. So from Akanaka, we then again board our aircraft and fly to a town uh, in northeastern Botswana called Kasani, very close to the border between uh, Botswana and Namibia and Angola and Zambia and Zimbabwe. So th the whole Southern African network come together. And from there we clear immigration and then board our plane for a short quick flight down the Zambezi towards Livingston. And Livingston again, higher rainfall, different vegetation, and again different birds like the scarlet chested sunbird which is a possibility on our um, on our boat trip day when we arrive we take a walk to, uh, have lunch and then go down and have a look at the famous victoria falls and the first thing the next morning we wake up uh, meet at the lookout over the river in front of our hotel and uh, do a bit of birding and then head off for what is one of the most magical events or activities on the whole tour and that is our early morning boat cruise above the Victoria Falls on one of Africa's iconic rivers the Zambezi and the birds that we pick up are include I mean they're plenty, all sorts of different things. But top left we have the uh, collared palm thrush, uh, it's beautiful mournful call, often heard as we are actually waiting to board our boat for the trip on the river. The half collared kingfisher, which is another really attractive member of the family that actually occurs on the route of our, our boat, uh, birding boat trip. Then the rock Pratton coal, which actually comes into the area as the Zambezi flood level subsides and the rocks such as the one this bird is sitting on become exposed. And this is in fact where these birds nest. They actually lay their eggs in depressions on these small little rocks in the middle of the fast flowing Zambezi River. And like all members of the Pratton coal family, they are they have this beautiful soft looking plumage, a bit like a silky flycatcher. They really are very neat and very attractive birds. And then probably one of the most attractive of the lapwing species, the white crowned or white winged lapwing, which is a bird um, which 
is found on the exposed sandbars as the floodwaters recede and that's again where the species nests. In the grounds of the hotel and on our visit to go and look at the Victoria Falls um, we've got a chance of picking up a bird called Charlo's Taraka and this beautiful bird with the brilliant vermilion flight feathers when this bird flies it's like this absolute blinding flash of, of, of red but this floppy crest this amazing eye makeup and uh, this rather quizzical sort of way that they have of looking at you make this one of the most exotic and one of the most exciting sightings that we hope for on our visit to Livingston. And then the other, and uh, this is one which for those of you who've actually battled to tick sun grebes around the world, the other two species can be hard. This one in many places in Southern Africa is also quite tricky, but on the Zambezi above the falls, we've actually been very lucky with this bird and on one trip have actually seen six individuals on the three hour boat trip on the river above the falls. So certainly this is one that we look for and uh, hope to show everybody on the tour and it's one of the more special birds of the entire trip. When you have shared a, a trip or travel log um, it's become almost traditional to end with a sunset and there's probably few places that are more spectacular, more beautiful than looking down across towards Zimbabwe, down the full face of the Victoria Falls and watching the sunset um, shining through Musi Uatunya, the local name for Victoria Falls, Musi Uatunya means the smoke that thunders and that raising uh, that rising spray coming out of the chasm is where the name comes from and <clears throat> if you time it right you get there you get these beautiful sort of orange and pink tinges if you're really lucky you can even get rainbows in the in the chasm and what better way to end an incredible trip across three different southern african countries and the, all the different experiences that that has entailed. Well, I hope that what I've shared with you has whet your appetite and maybe given you um, maybe some encouragement to join us. Uh, for those of you who want to know more, there's a bit of information about who is involved in this year's tour later this year. And also, if you are interested in finding out more, please contact Eric at the numbers provided at the bottom of your screen. And uh, that was for the pre-tour. And again, I urge anybody who's coming all this way, think seriously about coming on the pre-tour because that would be uh, a completely different aspect to Namibia and would definitely give you a lot of interesting insights into the country. Uh, so from my side, I'd like to say thank you very much. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for traveling with me. And I hope I'll see some of you on future tours. Jeff, thank you for that wonderful, fascinating and detailed presentation. Uh, thanks, Ben. And uh, thanks, everybody. I mean, for Jeff, can you tell us a little bit about what to expect weather wise throughout this tour? OK, well, we are effectively traveling in southern Africa at the end of our winter season. It is possible that we could still get some some cold, cold days normally associated with uh, fronts which move up out of the Southern Ocean and sweep across. And under those conditions, the temperatures usually go no lower than around freezing. Some mornings we may have a light frost on the ground when we wake up. Um, but typically by eight o'clock, nine o'clock, it's actually pleasantly warm. And uh, it then could get slightly cool during the evenings as well. 
so we've we've gone into some detail in the tour description and um fairly full instructions as to what is what you can expect weather wise but typically the most appropriate things are really getting involved um with stuff that you can put on first thing as we go birding early in the morning and then shed usually even before you come back for for your breakfast it's time to go you know it's time to start uh stripping off those warm layers and that's the most appropriate type of clothing it's highly unlikely uh but not um, impossible that we actually have rain um it's happened i think once in 20 tours but it's obviously always uh worth being prepared particularly with a light mac and then if there is a really good flood on the zambezi when we get to the falls when we go to the view site to look across the chasm at the waterfall itself um that area in fact can develop into a a rainforest from all the spray that is thrown up by the the, the water as it plunges uh 120 odd feet into the chasm. Uh, we have a question from Margaret, and she says, first of all, thanks for this wonderful presentation. And her question is, uh, do you keep an eBird list uh, to share with participants? I don't, I'm afraid. Uh, this is not something that I have typically become involved with. And, and the reason for it is we're running a parallel um, atlasing project in Southern Africa, which um, I originally was part of the original steering committee for. And so I, uh, my loyalties are there. But there are comprehensive lists of all... Uh, wildlife seen on the tours that are available from the vent office if you if you require um, and they are will probably give you your best idea not only of where we've seen stuff but for example in the case of Pell's Fishing Owl uh, we often see that both at Maseri and then if we're lucky again at Akanaka so it also gives you a sense of of whether there's more than one shot at something you might be particularly interested in. As far as the flights are concerned, if you come to the coast, you obviously have your your um, your scheduled airline flight that brings you from probably Johannesburg to Valfus Bay. Then there is a charter flight up to the Waterberg, and then we fly again from just outside of Etosha, on the eastern side of Etosha, into the Caprivi Strip. And then we have another flight from Maseri down to Akanaka. And then finally, we have a flight which we, we, we stop over basically at Kasani uh, just to clear immigration and then carry on down into Livingston. So all of that is included in the tour. Um, you will have seen that um, it is a fairly pricey tour and Part of the reason is, in fact, the number of charter flights involved. But we found that the actual time we are able to spend at the destinations rather than the travel getting there, um, this option has definitely worked out better for us. And as for single supplements, there usually, there usually is a chance at a single supplement um, but that depends on bookings and just how many other people are interested in what the makeup of the group is. And, and just to comment on that too, uh, Elizabeth, the single supplement would be uh, in the wheelhouse of Eric Lindqvist, the operations manager. Um, please feel free to contact him, email eric at ventbird.com or call our home office to get in touch with him for more details. Uh, Jeff, we have a, a question here from Jim. He wonders, how often are Victoria Falls very devoid of adequate water to make an impressive site? <laughs> um, okay, this is one of the um, possible downsides of the timing of this trip. 
Uh, and that is that if we do have a very dry season, it tends to be region wide. And just as um, the Okavango depends on water or, uh, originating in Angola, a substantial part of what goes over the Victoria Falls comes from that side as well. There's a couple of big rivers involved which merge just upstream of the falls. Um, there's always some water, uh, but what you see in the picture is probably one of the worst case scenarios. It's still impressive, but it's certainly not as mind blowing as it has been. Um, I've been several times, not so much with vent, but on uh, private trips where the water coming over the falls actually is too much. And all you can hear is noise and all you can see is spray because the amount of spray thrown up totally obscures the full face. So in the picture on screen, you would walk down the left-hand side um, at the height of the top of the falls and you would then look across a, uh, a distance of maybe 100 yards um, at the full face. And if the falls are flowing too strongly, it literally, you lose it altogether. It's, 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 you ideally want a good flow, um, but not, not full on, full on flood, because otherwise you will still not know what the falls look like. So we'd need the appropriate amount of pulas with our sundowners. You need lots of, I think having Pula on our sundowners would actually not be uh, uh, quite the right time to actually ensure a good flow over the falls. But yeah, it's, it's, it's a special place. It's always, always brilliant. The birds around the area of the falls are great. Uh, the boat trip is great. Something I didn't touch on, but there's a, a trip into the local national park which is along the Zambezi, just upstream of the falls. And included there, we often go across to the population of introduced white rhinoceros, which are permanently under armed guard. And you're able, because they're so used to their guards, they're actually completely relaxed around people. And you can literally walk up to one of these, these real... Um, ancient looking giants and uh you know enjoy it from very close range on foot but yeah it's it's africa is a dry country this year um my garden here in johannesburg i stay in a large municipal park is so wet it's unpleasant walking around at the moment and we should be well out of our rainy season so it's an unpredictable thing but it looks like this year should be good because rains across Southern Africa have been generally good. And that, that normally translates into good prospects for, uh, for Zambia and the Victoria Falls. Well, that's, that's terrific news. Uh, the last uh, entry we have here, a comment from Richard, he says, have been there several times, and we just wanted to thank Jeff for a delightful presentation during which we learned some additional info. Brilliant. And like your use of the English language. Thank you, Richard. I've enjoyed chatting with everybody. Well, uh, thank you so much, Jeff, for your presentation today. And thank you, everyone in the audience, for tuning in. And also want to give one more thank you to Dr. Danielle Wolf for her audio recording of the uh, rhinoceroses and to Zeno Canto for their amazing audio clips of bird calls. Sorry, sorry, uh, Ben, I see there's one more question that's come through and that asks about the nature of the walking portions of the tour. In fact, this tour has very little walking involved. Once we get into the national parks like Itosha, and to a lesser extent at um, Kakanika, Akanaka, we end up um, effectively being limited into just what we can do from a walking perspective. Uh, there's a bit of walking in the Waterberg, um, 
and also a little bit of walking around on the coast, but it's not very strenuous. It's generally not on uneven or, or steep ground. So it's a fairly easy tour from that perspective. Wonderful. Thank you for catching that, Jeff. And if there are any other questions uh, after we're after online, uh, please send them to me, ben at ventbird.com or eric at ventbird.com. And uh, we hope to see you in the field someday. Thanks, everybody. And thanks from me.